Uh, hello and uh, good morning to everyone who's joined into this uh, webcast. Uh, my name is Subhu and I uh, am a senior director here at Nowscape um, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, logging in and we are uh, very excited to have um, Professor Raj Raghunathan um, from the University of Texas at uh, joining us today. Um, and uh, very shortly I will introduce him to all of you and we'll get started uh, with the webinar. So once again, thanks for making the time out um, and uh, very excited to have all of you here as well. Um, so uh, let me begin this uh, uh, you know, webcast uh, by uh, setting up a few uh, guidelines for, for those of you who have logged into the, to the webinar. Uh, is that uh, the way that we will conduct this webinar is that for the first, uh, you know, first part of this um, presentation, we will have uh, Professor uh, Raghunathan take us through the key points uh, that he wants to cover through this uh, uh, talk of his, uh, post which we will open up uh, the discussion for Q&A. Uh, so as we proceed through the webinar, if you have any questions, I would request you to type it out in your um, window, in your chat window or in the Q&A section of your window uh, so that it comes to us and then we can answer them uh, towards the uh, second section of the webinar. Uh, so that's broadly, um, you know, in terms of guidelines, that's broadly what I want to share with all of you. So once again, thanks for logging in. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to uh, begin with uh, with a short introduction of uh, Professor uh, Raghunathan. Um, and uh, here we go. So uh, he's a Zale Centennial Professor of Business at the McCombs School of Business at the University of, uh, University of Texas at Austin. Um, he, he's interested to explore how people's judgments and decisions impact their happiness and fulfillment. Um, Raj's work has appeared in top journals, such as the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Consumer Research, uh, Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Consumer Psychology, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, um, Information Systems Research, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Uh, his work has also been cited in several mass media outlets, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, Fortune, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, Inc., a fast company and the Los Angeles Times. Um, the professor writes about his views on happiness and leadership on his popular Psychology Today blog with over 1.5 million page views, uh, Sapien Nature. Uh, his six week long Coursera course on happiness titled A Life of Happiness and Fulfillment, which incidentally I have also taken, um, has currently over 250,000 students um, from 196 countries and was voted the top MOOC of 2015 and one of the top 50 MOOCs of all time. Um, a professor's book uh, titled, If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Happy? was launched in 2016 and has been translated into 13 languages. A uh, professor has also delivered several keynote lectures and his TED talk, which was aired on Star TV India, was viewed by over 17 million people worldwide. Um, so that's a very short introduction of, uh, well, not very short, I think it was <laughs> slightly long, but as you can see, I'm very excited to have uh, Professor uh, Raghunathan join us. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, with that, I wanted to end with, uh, you know, with the group here, before we get started, uh, two uh, cents from my end, which is that because I took the course and I have had the opportunity to read his book, uh, what were the top three takeaways for me? I thought, let me do that and then hand it over to Professor. He can probably take it from there. So for me personally, uh, I think three things that I learned from his course, which I would strongly urge everybody who's logged in here to, uh, to at least look at. Um, so the top three things for me were uh, that, you know, we tend to devalue happiness a lot. Uh, so, you know, keeping happiness front and center in our lives uh, in itself is, uh, is, is, you know, a great opportunity for us to experience it. That was number one. Uh, second is that it's important to be neither needy nor avoidant. So, you know, we need to find the middle ground uh, and uh, try to be generous, uh, you know, in, in how we lead our lives. And we need to be dispassionate in our pursuit of passion. Uh, so, I, it's, it's slightly counterintuitive and I will, uh, you know, hope Professor will also throw some light on this later when he speaks. Um, is that it's, it's important to be dispassionate in the way that you pursue your passion so that you can stay flexible and be patient uh, in whatever it is that you're going for. Right, so with that, um, you know, I'm going to hand it over to Professor. Thanks a lot, Professor, for uh, coming on board and taking the time out to uh, speak to our folks here. Thank you, Subhu. Uh, very kind, nice introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to jump in directly into uh, what I wanted to talk about, as uh, main focus uh, for today's webinar. Um, that way, uh, even if I finish a little early, uh, it's not a problem. We have more time for Q&A. Okay, so um, 
this topic of happiness uh, i've been exploring it uh, from a very personal individualistic uh, perspective if you will um, that is that i was very interested in this topic of let's say somebody is interested in uh, maximizing or enhancing their happiness and fulfillment levels what might they do uh, what might they do differently from what they've been doing and so on and this is a question that uh, has always been around of course you know buddha famously left his kingdom for this uh, for the answer to this question and aristotle and many other people have been uh, after the answer to this question and i think we are very lucky now uh, because we have a lot of um, scientific evidence uh, to speak on this topic and my usp so, so to speak uh, is to harness a lot of that material and i've contributed uh, some to that area myself and uh, try and synthesize it and um, uh, you know disseminate bite sized modules if you will to uh, the lay public quote unquote lay public um, that is the people are not necessarily doing research in this area or not aware of research in this area and so on more recently however i've moved into this um, area of uh, organizational happiness if you will um, and uh, you know it was a kind of an organic move uh, i think that i'm in a part of a business school obviously it makes sense for me to think about organizations and businesses and so on um, but also uh, one of the things that i discovered is that happiness doesn't just feel good right uh, which might be a big reason why we seek happiness because it al- it almost seems like yeah you know i mean it feels good it's axiomatic that i should want to be happy um because it feels good it doesn't just feel good uh, it is also functional quote unquote functional to be happy and what i mean by that is that uh, there are a bunch of downstream consequences positive consequences that emerge um out of being happy so happier people see more of these consequences these positive consequences than do their uh, less happy counterparts so let me just uh, talk about three in particular um one uh, right at the top as you can see uh, it's a happy healthy heart um and that is to signify this idea that happier people are healthier uh, lots and lots of studies on this uh, i think one of the more famous studies looked at the happiness of nuns as uh, they aged and uh, looked at how long these nuns ended up living and uh, the interesting thing about the study was it was a longitudinal study you know over a long period of time and it looked at these nuns as they you know, grew into old age and uh, eventually died and uh, they categorized these nuns into uh, three groups uh, the least happy nuns the medium happy nuns and the most happy nuns mm, and they did this based off of uh, journal entries that these nuns had made when they had joined the monastery so a long time back right so their happiness at that point determined how long they ended up living later on um the most happy nuns ended up living uh, 11 years longer than the least happy nuns so that's a big big effect okay uh, lots of other studies like i said that have looked at uh, this issue of the link between happiness and health happier people have better respiratory systems better immune systems better um, muscular vascular systems and and so on okay so uh, it just have an, has an overall positive effect it's like a tonic for your body um the second uh, functional uh, downstream consequence of happiness which is represented by this picture of the three people holding hands on the bottom right hand uh, side of your of your uh, screen uh is supposed to signify this idea that happier people enjoy better relationships uh they have um uh, a higher chance of getting married uh, to begin with they have a higher chance of making friendships that last uh and a you know very obvious intuitive reason for this is that happier people are more giving when you're not happy when you're stressed out when you have a problem you obviously you know maybe justifiably you uh, wanted to address that problem first you want to address that problem and therefore you have less bandwidth so to speak or mind space head space uh, to devote to other people's problems and other people's concerns uh, so you're kind of caught in your own little quagmire uh, when you're unhappy and a lot of studies show that that uh, this translates into better team uh, work you're you're more likely to be a better um, uh, partner in a team Uh, if you're a happier person than if you're not uh, just to go back to the health aspect the organizational consequence of being healthier is that you're less likely to take sick leave okay so lots of studies have shown that uh, on average uh, people who are happier take about 16 less sick day leaves in a year than people who are unhappy okay 16 days is a huge number right um in the us <laughs> you you get only 2 weeks of holidays okay uh so if you're taking more than 2 weeks off because you're sick then that basically doubles the number of days that you're absent from work 
there's a huge, uh, huge effect. Mm. So unsurprisingly, because of these two effects alone, you would expect happier people to be more productive, which is the picture on the lower left-hand side. And indeed, that's uh, been shown to be the case. Uh, not just because happier people show up for work more, they're healthier, take less sick leave, uh, and they are better teammates. It's also shown that happier people are more creative, happier people are more objective. In fact, I have one of my own papers in this area uh, that talks about the link between happiness and objectivity. Um, so happier people make more, um, uh, make better decisions. Uh, so add all this together, you would expect happier people to earn more money. And in fact, that is true, not just for themselves. They also are uh, going to be earning more money for their organizations. They're going to make their organizations more profitable and productive. Uh, on average, uh, this is work from Ed Diener, who's looked at a lot of other studies. He's done what's called a meta-analysis. And he concludes that because of all these and other, other effects that I, I don't have the time to get into here, uh, organizations with happier employees are on, on average 9% more profitable than organizations with less happy employees. Okay, this is a huge effect, right? I mean, if you ask any manager and you tell them that, look, I'm going to have this intervention or I have this new idea that's going to increase your profitability by 9%, they jump uh, at it, okay? And, and this is it, okay? If you make your employees happier, then they're going to be uh, more productive and therefore your organization is going to be more profitable, okay? So uh, the question then is, uh, what does it take uh, to enhance the happiness of your employees? How can you enhance your own happiness? Of course, there's a lot in it for you uh, personally. Even if you um, <clears throat> do not really increase the happiness of your coworkers, uh, you can increase your own happiness that would uh, stand you in good stead. What can you do? Uh, before I get to that, let me just talk a little bit about what is happiness uh, to begin with. Um, obviously, this is an important topic because happiness is such a central concept and construct to a lot of stuff that I'm, being, I'm going to be covering. So, <clears throat> This is important to touch on. And I'm going to define happiness in a very broad way. I'm going to talk about happiness as uh, consisting of uh, four different kind of positive components, if you will. So one, the obvious one perhaps is uh, pleasure. So you're happier when you have a good meal, you're happier when you've had a good sleep, you're happier when you have a good massage, for example, right? Or a nice warm um, shower to take when you feel clean and so on. So uh, this pleasure is, is sensory, right? I mean, it's through the five senses, anything positive that comes in through these five senses, uh, that would, uh, all else being equal, uh, enhance your happiness levels. The second one, which is also relatively obvious, is positivity. This, these are positive emotions that you feel. Uh, say you're in love um, or you, know, you get an award, you feel proud, um, somebody does you a good turn uh, and, and you feel a sense of gratitude. All these are positive emotions. And uh, you can think of um, you know, at least 10 different kinds of positive emotions. It turns out um, that love uh, is the most prevalent one. Uh, around the world, okay? <coughs> uh, joy turns out to be the second most prevalent, serenity or tranquility, calmness, peace turns out to be the third and so on, okay? You can think about laughter, you can think about uh, curiosity, um, interest, engagement in something. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm just gonna take a drink of water here. Okay. Um, the third and the fourth categories are very interesting. Meaning has to do with contributing to other people. Um, that's the way that I define it at least. Uh, and you can think about uh, the positivity that a mother derives from, let's say, feeding a child, right? And that's, um, of course, uh, universally, everybody would immediately understand that's a source of positivity for the mom. But uh, our circle of kindness and compassion actually expands uh, to be far more en encompassing. So we could be kind to an animal and derive happiness from it. We could be kind to the planet. We could be kind to the universe. You know, uh, As human beings, we have the capacity to expand our psychological boundaries uh, to absorb and um, encapsulate or encompass uh, really vast uh, uh, external uh, stimuli. Um, the interesting thing about contributing to other people is that lot, we know lots of examples of people who actually derive a lot of happiness from this, even if um, they are going through physical pain themselves. So people who jumped into the World Trade Center, for example, if you stop them and ask them, are you crazy? What are you doing? This is not happiness enhancing. They'd probably say, no, I mean, this is consistent with my value. You know, I, I've been trained to save people and it makes me happy to do that. Even if there is a risk, of course, I'm scared. 
Um, but I have to overcome this fear in order to do what my duty is. Okay. Similar thing with purpose. Uh, I define purpose as finding something that um, is so engaging and immersive that you lose track of time doing it. <clears throat> Perhaps Subu and uh, other people at uh, Nolscape uh, find a lot of purpose in what they do, right? Um, bringing in education and gamification of um, these uh, concepts like change management and so on at Nolscape. Uh, I find purpose in what I do. Uh, it's very immersive for me to think about happiness issues and uh, to uh, read up on it and to do research on it. Uh, oftentimes I lose track of time and uh, my interests, my aptitudes, my um, worldviews, uh, my values are uh, almost completely aligned with my life's work. So that gives me a sense of purpose. Um, of course, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a added bonus that it is also, I think, helping people out. So I also derive meaning from it. Okay, and you could think of something that gives you purpose without really um, contributing to meaning um, in the way that I've defined meaning. For example, if um, you, you love, let's say playing trivia, right? And uh, you're by yourself and you're with your computer and you're playing trivia games, uh, you're playing Sudoku or you're doing crosswords, or you're playing the guitar, nobody else is listening to you. That gives you purpose, but it doesn't necessarily contribute to other people. Okay, so uh, you can think of happiness as a kind of an umbrella term. Um, and, you know, a very short definition of happiness that I find uh, useful for me is that happiness is um, being in a state uh, that you would rather not be somewhere else doing something else. Okay, if you're, if you're completely content with where you are right now, with who's uh, around you and the circumstances around you, etc., then you're happy. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you could be very happy being on a roller coaster ride, even though you're, you're afraid and it's going up and down and uh, your heart is in your mouth, but you'd rather not be somewhere else doing something else. Um, so that's happiness. Okay. So in a, in a weird way, happiness actually in the way that I've defined it includes a lot of negative emotions under it. Okay. Uh, there is a time and place for fear. There is a time and place for disappointment. There's a time and place for perhaps even envy. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So long as you're not feeling that I, I, I don't want this, I don't want to feel this. <coughs> Pardon me, guys. I, I'm just going to get a glass of hot water. I'll be back in just a minute. <coughs> All right. So, so long as you're not um, feeling like, you know, fragmented in a sense that internally you'd rather not be where you are, not feeling what you're feeling. Uh, I would say that you're at least content, if not happy. All right. So let me jump into this main topic on which I want to spend about, say, 40 minutes. <clears throat> which is this topic of uh, what does it <clears throat> take to be happy at work? So um, I have this uh, model, which I call the Bamba model. And the Bamba really represents five things. Okay, the first B in Bamba represents uh, basic needs. Uh, as you can imagine, you can't really be happy if you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, or you don't have enough medical attention, right? The, the A, uh, first A, uh, represents <coughs> a sense of autonomy which I define as uh, the freedom to do the things that you want to do. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what's happening. I mean, Hyderabad just came in and I think the uh, atmosphere is pretty dusty out here. So <clears throat> um, my, my throat is a little dry. Okay. Uh, the M stands for a sense of mastery. Uh, people really can't be happy, uh, particularly maybe at work. Um, if, if they don't get a sense that they're progressing towards becoming increasingly skilled at what they do. <coughs> the, B, the second B represents a belonging, which is a sense of connect, connectivity or a sense of friendship uh, with your coworkers. And finally, the A represents the cultural elements. And um, I define a happy culture as an abundance oriented culture. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so let me let me jump into the basic needs to begin with and, and what they are. And uh, why it's important. Oh, yeah. Uh, before I do that, I, I need to very quickly mention this idea of it, take, it takes two to Bamba. Okay. So we've all, all heard this expression, it takes two to 
uh, tango, of course. And in a similar way, you know, you can think of uh, Bamba as a dance, let's say, if you think of uh, La Bamba, right? I mean, uh, uh, it, let's say it's a dance. Um, then I would say that uh, there are two major sources uh, that contribute to uh, all these five elements. And one source is, of course, yourself. You know, you're one of the dancers. You meaning uh, the employee um, is, a, is one of the sources. And the other source is, of course, uh, everybody else, right? The organization, the culture of the organization, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, in my opinion, uh, and this is based off of some research by Sonia Libomirsky and some other people, um, you are the lead dancer uh, when it comes to the Bamba dance in the sense that you uh, can actually have a much bigger impact on your own happiness than your organization can. Okay, why do I say this? I say this because uh, if you look at uh, the work on happiness, uh, there is something called the set point theory. Um, essentially, what it argues is that a good chunk of your happiness, about 50% um, of your happiness depends on your, on your genetic material, your DNA, okay? There's nothing much that you can do about it, okay? You're, some people are born happier than other people are, just like some people <coughs> are born fairer than other people are, some people are born taller than other people are, and so on. Uh, the rest of the 50%, it turns out, uh, only about 10% depends on your external circumstances. What kind of a house you live in, uh, whether you're successful in life or not, and, and so on, okay? That's surprising to a lot of people. Uh, it surprised me too when I first encountered it. But over time, I've, I've gotten to realize how true it is, okay? Which is why we, you find a lot of really successful but <laughs> miserable people, right? And, and the, the reverse too, that you find people who, are, who don't have a whole lot but seem to be quite content if not happy. The reason for that is that a large chunk of what's under our control in terms of happiness depends on our attitudes. Okay, full 40% depends on the way in which we see the world, how we perceive the world. And that part of it um, is the one that is going to be the biggest contributor uh, to your happiness. Only 10% is going to come from how other people treat you, how your organization treats you. A full 40% is going to come from how you view the world. Okay, this is why I say, Although it takes two to Bamba, you are the lead dancer of this Bamba dance. Okay, so with that, with that backdrop, I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, things that you can do to enhance your own happiness at work. I, I want to make this as uh, practically applicable as possible. So uh, in the process of talking about these three things you can do, um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, you know, some of these five elements that I mentioned earlier, the, the, the Bamba elements. Okay, so the very first one, is uh, the tip is to protect what I call your, your cream time, okay? A lot of work and a lot of books uh, written about this topic of what distinguishes, ultimately what distinguishes really successful people uh, from the not so successful is, is grit, uh, is hard work, is doing what Cal Newport calls deep work, okay? Uh, in other words, you really can't aspire to progress towards mastery in any domain unless you devote a significant amount of time uh, doing pretty deliberate, very um, thoughtful, um, well uh, thought through, in other words, uh, 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 you know, progression towards uh, this thing that you want to master, this domain that you want to master. So <clears throat> a lot of books written on the topic, of course, uh, Anders Ericsson has a book called Peak, um, you know, he comes up with this uh, 10,000 hour rule uh, that became famous, uh, um, that, that was made famous by Malcolm Gladwell in Outliers, right? <clears throat> so if you work backwards from it, if it requires 10,000 hours, which by the way is about, you know, 10 to 15 years of your life uh, in order to progress towards mastery, in order to achieve mastery, then it makes sense that you're going to have to carve out that time, okay? Uh, and uh, the best a way to do this is to protect the time of the day when you're the most um, active, most creative, most mentally sharp, you know, assuming that we do, uh, we all do mental work rather than physical work for the most part. Okay, so uh, uh, it turns out that different people have different uh, times when they are uh, at their peak uh, mental abilities. Uh, me, uh, I'm more alert in the morning, okay, uh, which would be around this time. <clears throat> so about maybe an hour or two after I wake up, and, and I, I 
do have a big slump uh, right around lunchtime, right after lunch especially. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I'd love to be able to take a siesta for half an hour. It turns out that that's actually a good thing um, in, in multiple ways. Uh, you, you shouldn't make it too long. It turns out that, you know, more than, say, 45 minutes, then, then it's going to disturb your night's sleep and so on. But if you can take about 20 to 30 minutes sleep, you're going to reemerge with that second big uh, cream time, if you will, uh, big kind of apex, as you can see on your screen. So you can actually harness, even if you harness only the first two to three hours, right, in a day, if you can consistently harness that cream time without being disturbed, without doing other things that are less important, uh, perhaps more urgent, but less important in your life, then uh, within a year, I would say, maybe even within a few months, you're going to progress rapidly towards uh, being better at what you do. Okay, so this is super important uh, in order to progress towards mastery, which I talked about as a very, very important component of your happiness. So I'm going to talk about uh, an exercise that consists of three steps uh, for protecting your cream time. So the first step, obviously, is to identify when you're the sharpest, when you're the most um, uh, best at making decisions, when you can think through subtleties and so on. Okay, and most of us probably have an intuitive idea. If not, you should sit down now and, and think deeply about this. For some of us, it's, it's at night. I have a friend who is most productive between uh, 10, p 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., okay? Usually this, this screen time doesn't last more than three hours, uh, which makes it all the more precious. It's fragile. So you really, really need to, need to protect it, okay? And uh, how do you protect it? So you need to find out how do you typically get distracted from, from being productive during your screen time? Is it the internet? Um, you know, it's okay to kind of, you know, do chunks of work, let's say for half an hour and then browse. I go to uh, crickinfo.com. Uh, big follower of cricket, <clears throat> but I would say try and avoid social media because that is very seductive, right? I mean, uh, for those, and I assume that most of you are, uh, you know, on WhatsApp and, and Facebook and so on, once you get into it, uh, it's very difficult to get out, okay? Um, maybe it's lack of planning. Um, maybe you commute during your cream time. If, if you have the option of working from home at that time, um, maybe that would involve setting up a home office. Um, others get distracted by what Stephen Covey calls um, urgent work, you know, what seems pressing right now, but is really not that important. Okay, that email can wait, uh, paying that bill can wait, you know, cashing in the check can wait. Uh, but important stuff, uh, you really need to devote your clean time to. Okay, that's step three. And then you need to come up with a plan. Okay, what I do is I actually switch off my phone, I switch off my phone, I um, also switch off my email. Um, I reduce the volume on my on my landline to zero so that I don't even hear it ringing. Um, it goes directly to the voicemail. I close my office door. Okay, I have my own office. I can afford to do it. Maybe some of us can't because we work in a cubicle, but you need to do what it takes. Okay, and maybe tell other people. You know, I don't think people will mind it if you tell them that, look, this is very, very important for me to protect this time. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I'll, I'll come back to you a little bit later. And over time, you know, within a couple of weeks, I would say people learn that, okay, you know, Raj works at this time. Uh, he's doing some important stuff, what he thinks is important and, and it's understandable, okay? <clears throat> so other people get distracted by people asking them to go to coffee or tea. It's okay to take these small breaks, okay? Maybe not more than say five, 10 minutes at most, but come back and, and be your most productive at this time. Again, if you can do three hours of this, just merely three hours of it every single day, but on a consistent basis, then I think that you're gonna see vast improvements in your productivity. Uh, <clears throat> as I already mentioned, um, you know, progression towards mastery is important, important for happiness and you can't really be a master unless you spend about 10,000 hours, okay, give or take. All right, let me uh, talk about the second thing you can do for enhancing happiness, which is to express gratitude uh, to your co-workers um, and also to uh, other people in your life. But since we're talking about work, especially to co-workers, okay. So I'm going to talk about, I believe, five steps I have here. One is to, um, uh, the first step is to think of a coworker who has had a positive influence on you, okay? And by the way, um, many of you might be doing many of these things naturally anyway, in which case, you know, hopefully you, you see this as a affirmation of uh, something that you instinctively do. Um, uh, if you're not doing it and you feel that uh, maybe you need to tweak this around a little bit, that's fine, right? I mean, you don't have to necessarily be formal about going through every step and so on. Okay, but this is something that I've discovered in my um, <clears throat> kind of collaborations and uh, consultations with, with lots of firms. I found employees um, find this to be useful. 
So you think of a coworker, it could be a boss, um, it could be uh, a colleague, it could be somebody uh, who works for you, maybe even unrelated to you, you know, somebody who's in a totally different department. It could even be um, a, a peon, right? Um, who's uh, sitting outside the office door every day. He's got a smile on his face and he's always ready to help you out, whoever it is, okay? Think of somebody and then write down why they had a positive influence on you. So try and make it as specific as you can, okay? In terms of sights and sounds and um, what had happened that particular day. Maybe you were driving down and um, you got stuck in a, in a traffic jam and uh, you were in a rush and you had to get out and run for a meeting. And at that point, somebody noticed that you were in the fix and they ran to you with an umbrella, okay? So just write down everything and why it was so important to you, okay? <clears throat> and then, uh, okay, <laughs> step four, it should be step three. So then write out a letter of gratitude uh, to this coworker. And, and finally, um, this is a very important step, uh, is to read it out um, or email it or, uh, you know, ideally you want to read it out to them uh, in a face-to-face -face setting because that's when this exercise has the biggest impact, okay? Um, obviously, you want to not make it corny for you and, you know, not make it artificial and, and all that. So you need to kind of uh, figure out a, a, the right context and the right time to do this. But most people have, uh, you know, this fear that this is going to turn out to be artificial. Uh, but in reality, uh, it turns out not at all to be that way, uh, particularly because as you can imagine, you know, from the other side, the person that you're thanking, uh, they, all, everybody, you know, it's human to like to be, to be appreciated, right? In fact, there are studies showing that even fake flattery, uh, where the person being praised knows it's fake, uh, they like it, okay? Um, and they think more positively of the person who's indulging in this fake flattery. Um, maybe because people realize, you know, to, to say good things to other people, even if it's fake, requires some level of biting, or, you know, suppressing your ego. And uh, almost everybody likes it. Unless, of course, you're flattering someone for a completely strategic reason. Okay. And that alone. And, and then maybe they won't appreciate it. But otherwise they do. Okay. So that's the simple exercise. Just these four steps. All right. <clears throat> Why is expressing gratitude important? Um, as I mentioned some time back, this idea of belonging in the Bamba model, which is the second B, is super important for happiness. Uh, lots and lots of studies on this. Um, one study looked at the so-called very happy people, uh, the top 10% of the happiest people uh, in the study, and they looked at different kinds of properties or characteristics these people had. You know, they tended to be religious, tended to live in small towns rather than big cities and so on. But there was one trait that every single last one of these 10% had, which is that they all had a sense of deep intimacy with at least one person in their life. Okay. Um, studies also show that if uh, you have your best friend working with you uh, in your firm, then your chances of quitting your company is actually halved. Okay. It's a huge uh, difference, right? I mean, you right, right now, nowadays, I mean, in India, uh, especially maybe in particular in the, in the IT outsourcing sector, uh, keeping holding on to people is a huge challenge. So if you can kind of foster a sense of friendship within the company, um, that's going to improve uh, a lot of things, including uh, productivity. Uh, it turns out that being grateful to others, uh, which might come as a surprise to people who are very, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, economics minded, uh, think of themselves and others as self-centered and um, completely individualistic. Uh, it turns out being grateful to others increases happiness in a number of ways. Uh, I'm going to talk about three ways here. So making others like you, uh, you know, they, they like you better when you offer help to them, right? And therefore, they feel a little bit of this obligation, if you will, to uh, offer help back to you. They want to reciprocate. As Adam Grant, who wrote this brilliant book called Give and Take, argues most of us uh, are matchers, what he calls matchers. That is that when somebody does us a good turn, we want to do them a good turn in return. Right. Um, so naturally, when you do good things to other people, and particularly if that's just part of your personality now, right, you've been doing it so often that it comes out naturally, they think of you as an authentically good person. And therefore, they're always there ready to help you, which, of course, is going to improve your chances of uh, success and happiness. Uh, the second reason, a very, very important reason has to do with the story you tell yourself about who you are. OK, when you're a genuinely kind person uh, the story you tell yourself about who you are is that I'm, I'm magnanimous. I'm big. My, my heart is big. I'm not a beggar, you know, where I'm constantly looking for other people to fill in my bowl because I feel empty and needy. And, um, you know, uh, Supu mentioned this idea of neediness. Right. So you're not going around like that. Rather, you're, 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 you're thinking of yourself as somebody whose cup is overflowing. 
and the milk of human kindness, as P.G. Wodehouse might have put it, um, is, is overflowing. And therefore, you're seeking uh, opportunities to help out other people. And that's a beautiful narrative to have about yourself, about who you are. And finally, um, you be grateful act, acts as a bridge. Uh, what happens when you are, you know, m m most of us, right? This, this is what happens when, when something, we do something um, successful, when we do something great, when we do something big, when we accomplish something, uh, it's natural to feel pride, a sense of pride that, you know, hey, I did this. Raj is no one quite like you. You know, nobody else might have done it as well as you, you you've done this and so on. Okay, and, and uh, pride is okay, okay? Uh, this is called hubristic pride, right? This feeling that I'm, I'm good, I'm great, I'm better than other people. Um, but the problem with pride, you know, counting aside, keeping aside uh, moralistic ethical angles on pride, you know, even from a very practical perspective, uh, pride doesn't last long, okay? If your happiness depends on being better than other people, sooner or later, somebody else is going to be better on, on some dimension or the other from you and so on. Lots of reasons why pride doesn't last long, okay? So it's better to move from an egotistical, uh, in terms of short-lived emotions such as pride to a non-egotistical, more sustainable emotion uh, like connection and, and love. Uh, and um, gratitude acts as a bridge that takes you from pride to connection. Because when you thank other people, particularly when you're successful, um, then it makes you think of other reasons why you've succeeded, not just your own hard work and smarts and all that. You're also now thinking about, okay, what are the ways in which the external world helped me? What are the ways in which other people help me? And that in turn makes you say positive things about those people or about external circumstances. And when you, when you express gratitude to other people, other people naturally want to now help you out, right? And so that builds this sense of uh, two-way connection with people, which, which I call love. Okay, so uh, the last one I want to talk about, perhaps the most important one, is to lead a healthy lifestyle, okay? And uh, I can't, you know, overemphasize the importance of this because this is the foundational block on which, uh, forget about happiness at work, right? I mean, happiness in life comes from. If you're, if you're, the cells in your body are not singing a happy, healthy tune, then forget about doing anything else, you know? Uh, it's not really going to have that much of an impact. So that, uh, you know, brings, I, I want to talk a little bit about what the healthy lifestyle is, but let me talk about uh, one, one kind of phenomenon that's happening that a guy called um, Hallowell uh, coins, the, he's coined the term ADT to refer to this phenomenon. Um, it's similar to ADD, attention deficit disorder, right? ADD, but he calls it attention deficit trait. Um, and what he means by that is that a lot of people around the world, particularly people who are working a relatively stressful job, jobs, mm, feel the sense of frazzlement, right? Feel the sense of intense time scarcity, feeling overwhelmed, uh, juggling too many balls in the air. And as a result of that, they're easily irritable, right? And they recognize it themselves. I've changed, you know? I mean, my wife asked me for a simple request and I snapped back at her. Um, work is no longer fun, right? Maybe it used to be at one point, but it's no longer fun. It's, you, you, you kind of feel boxed in. Uh, you have to pay the bills. You have, you're accustomed to a certain lifestyle. And so you just continue to do it like a rat in a, or a hamster in a, in a wheel, right? Uh, it's become a chore and you wait for the weekends. Uh, thank goodness it's Friday kind of phenomenon. Um, and, you know, the reasons for ADT are relatively obvious, right? You bite off more than you can chew and you've been... Uh, obligated with unrealistically um, high targets. And at one point, you maybe used to self-medicate, right? That's the right term uh, to, to deal with this. Like, you know, maybe um, have a couple of drinks in the evening, um, maybe even smoke, right? Um, maybe kind of get pampering massages and so on and so forth. Maybe eat unhealthy food. And over time, that's become your lifestyle now, right? That's the way that it, in which you, uh, you deal with the stress. Uh, and... Uh, if you kind of add that up over about 10, 15 years, not surprising that a lot of us are overweight with bags under our eyes, with marriages don't, that don't really work, um, with no real kind of good, intimate, close friends. Uh, the laughter in life is gone, right? And if you can empathize with any of this, then it means that you're probably suffering from this thing, ADT. And if you email me, I'll send you this article. Uh, it came out in HBR on, on this, and you can Google it and get it. Okay, so... Um, the opposite of ADT is to lead a healthy lifestyle. You know, that, that is ultimately the only real fix. Okay, there's no silver bullet. There's no 
uh, other kind of quick fix. You have to kind of go back to the basics and, and lead a healthy lifestyle, which consists of three components. One is eating well, um, not eating junk food. Okay, people ask me, what does eating well mean, right? I would say that in the Indian context, um, there's a good book on this topic called The South Asian Diet Solution. The South Asian Diet Solution. We South Asians, uh, particularly maybe South Indians, uh, eat uh, too much rice, too much rice and too much sugar. If you can just drop these two things or at least minimize it, uh, you're going to see a huge boost. Okay, it's maybe going to take a couple of weeks, okay, maybe even a couple of months in order to see some of these effects, but you will see it. Okay, you'll start losing weight. Uh, your your waist will become slimmer, um, and that is one thing that I would very highly recommend. Of course, don't eat junk food; right goes without saying. And um, then, if you can combine these two things with eating lots and lots of veggies, okay, it's going to take time to do all this. Um, and at this point, don't focus on quantity reduction. Right, um, you can eat as much as you want, but uh, do not eat these two categories and eat lots and lots of veggies instead. If you can do this, then I think you're well on your way to eating well. Moving more, um, getting at least 20 minutes of exercise each day. Um, one of the ways in which to do it is to get a treadmill at home, right? If you can afford it or join a gym. Um, morning is better because it, it, working out boosts your mood, as most of you know. Uh, it does it kind of remarkably well, right? Consistently, if there's one buck you up in life, it's, it's working out, right? Um, and if you uh, are somebody who finds it difficult to get yourself motivated, I would say get a trainer. You know, uh, if you're on this webinar, you're probably earning enough to, to be able to afford a trainer. So get a trainer, right? I mean, this is one thing on which you're going to, this, this money is going to be really well spent. Uh, well spent. Because later on, uh, if you don't spend this money right now, you're probably going to pay twice, thrice as much uh, to, to get medicine and go to the doctor and so on. Okay. Um, and finally, sleeping better. It turns out, we need at least seven hours of sleep a day, okay? Uh, there's many tips for getting a good night's sleep, and I'm gonna play you guys a short video about five minutes long by this guy called Matthew Walker, who's got this brilliant book out called Why We Sleep. And uh, this video is actually a good summary of the book, so let's watch it. My name is Matthew Walker. I am a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley and I am the author of the book, Why We Sleep. What are things that we can all do tonight and in the future to start getting better sleep? Well, beyond carving out a non-negotiable eight hour sleep opportunity, there are probably at least five things that we can do. The first is that we have to try and maintain regularity. And if there's one thing that you take away from this, it would be going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, no matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend, even if you've had a bad night of sleep, still wake up at the same time of day and reset. The second thing is that we are a dark deprived society in this modern era. And we need darkness in the evening to allow the release of a hormone called melatonin. And melatonin helps the healthy timing of our sleep. So try to dim down half the lights in your home in the hour before bed. Stay away from screens, especially those LED screens. They emit blue light that actually puts the brakes on melatonin. And those blue light emitting devices fool your brain into thinking that it's still daytime, even though it's nighttime and you want to get to sleep. The third uh, key ingredient is to keep it cool. Many of us actually have a bedroom that's too warm in terms of temperature. So an optimal temperature is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit or about 18 and a half degrees Celsius. And the reason is that your brain and your body need to drop their core temperature by about two to three degrees Fahrenheit to initiate good sleep. And that's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. So having a cool room actually takes your brain and body in the right temperature direction to get good sleep. The fourth critical factor is actually avoiding alcohol and caffeine. Um, unfortunately, this makes me deeply unpopular, but um, alcohol is perhaps the most misunderstood drug when it comes to sleep. People think that it helps them fall asleep. That's not actually true. Alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives. And what you're doing is just knocking your brain out. You're not putting it into natural sleep. 
We also know that alcohol will fragment your sleep, so you'll wake up many more times throughout the night. And alcohol is also a very potent chemical for blocking your dream sleep or your rapid eye movement sleep. Caffeine is also a problem. Many of us know that caffeine can keep us awake. It's an alerting chemical. It's a stimulant in terms of a class of drugs. But few people know that even if you can have a cup of coffee after dinner and you fall asleep fine and maybe you stay asleep, the depth of the deep sleep that you have when there is caffeine within your brain isn't as deep as when you have abstained from that cup of coffee after dinner. So as a consequence, you wake up the next morning, you feel unrefreshed, and you don't remember waking up or having a difficult time falling asleep, but now you find yourself reaching for two or three cups of coffee in the morning, and you develop this dependency, this addiction cycle. The fifth and final tip for better sleep is to not stay in bed awake. So if you haven't fallen asleep within 20 or so minutes, or you've woken up and you're finding it difficult to fall back asleep, don't stay in bed awake. The reason is that your brain very quickly starts to learn the association between your bed being about the place that you're awake rather than your bed being about sleep. So the advice is to get up, go to uh, another room, and in dim light, just read a book. No screens, no email checking, no food. And only when you feel sleepy should you return to bed. And that way you can actually then relearn the association between your bedroom being about the place of sleep rather than being awake. I should also note that some people don't like the idea of getting up and uh, going out to a different room if it's dark and they're warm in bed. An alternative is actually meditation. Meditation has been demonstrated in clinical trials to help people just relax the body, calm down the fight or flight branch of the nervous system that can happen when we wake up in the middle of the night and we have that Rolodex of anxiety thoughts. And by meditating, you can start to quiet the mind as well as the body, and that also helps you fall back asleep more easily. Okay. So uh, I think that's all I had. Um, I, I just want to summarize. So happiness is very important at work, perhaps the biggest determinant of your long-term success. Okay, and the five major determinants, I, I kind of went over them relatively quickly. And maybe some of you guys have some questions about the, those five elements. I'm happy to take them. And then I talked about this idea of takes two to Bamba. And finally, I talked about three things you can do. Uh, starting today, hopefully these are things that are relatively easy to do. Uh, and uh, I would really urge you to get a head start on it ASAP. Uh, it's really, really helped me. I know it's helped a lot of other people that I've uh, talked to and uh, I've, uh, firms that I've consulted with. And um, you know, if later you have the time and you remember this, please do email me uh, some sort of you know report or just a kind of let me know how it's going. Or of course you can ask me questions. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciated it. Great. Thank you, uh, Professor, for taking us to your uh, lovely presentation. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to open the floor now for questions, uh, if you have any for uh, Professor. Uh, meanwhile, Professor, I was thinking you could also just type out your email address in case people want to reach out to you. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, okay. And uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, feel free to type it down on the uh, on the chat uh, chat box or uh, the Q&A section of your, uh, of your screen. And Professor will be happy to uh, take your questions. So I think we have a couple coming in already and we can get started with those. So um, Kapilesh asks, Professor, if you'll get a copy of the presentation. Yes, uh, so we'll upload this uh, on YouTube, the video itself, and hopefully the, the deck also on slide share and I will share it with you, uh, with the group Kapilesh. So you should have that. Um, how do you measure happiness in an organization? That's the question that uh, Kapilesh is asking. Okay, that's a great question. Um, it turns out that uh, there are a few scales for measuring happiness at work. Uh, and if you email me, I can email you back uh, one of the scales that's been used. Uh, there are a few books on the topic now, you know, um, in the last about 15, 20 years, a lot of work has been done on this topic. And so a few popular books have come out. There's one book called How to be Happy at Work um, by somebody called Annie McKee. Uh, she's at Harvard, I believe. 
so you might want to uh, take a look at that book. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be coming out of the book on this topic myself, but I am going to be offering a course on the topic on uh, edX. It's going to be not on Coursera. Um, unlike my earlier course, uh, this is going to be through UT Austin. And uh, that course is going to be called um, Happier Employees and Return on Investment. So be on the lookout for it. If you're interested, you can take that course. It'll likely be free or low cost. Okay. So um, those are the resources. Okay. Great. Thanks, uh, Professor. So a few more coming in. I'm going to take them as they come. And, uh, okay. um, so uh, Dilbar Dilza Dangor, I think, is asking, um, according to you, what is the role of HR in improving happiness at work? So you would imagine that the HR ought to be at the forefront of this, right? Uh, HR naturally seems to be the most uh, relevant department for uh, being concerned with the topic of uh, well-being of employees, happiness of employees, and so on. Um, traditionally, though, HR has been more interested in uh, the morale, satisfaction, and engagement of employees. And uh, those are slightly different, okay? Uh, those, uh, from the employee's perspective, if uh, somebody wants to, comes to you and says, okay, I want to increase your engagement, I want to increase your morale, I want to increase your uh, productivity, that seems like the employee could say, okay, that's great for the organization, what's in it for me, you know? Uh, whereas happiness, well-being of the employee seems much more centrally directed towards what what's of interest to the employee uh, themselves, okay? So that's one difference. Uh, now, satisfaction is something that is kind of in between, I would say, uh, the happiness of the employees and the morale and um, uh, engagement and all that. And that is, uh, of course, under the purview of HR. But what has unfortunately happened over the years, and maybe you can, you can kind of empathize with this, or maybe you can correct me if you belong to a good, good organization, right? HR departments have been relegated to play a kind of second fiddle to other or other departments, particularly I would say finance and marketing, right? Um, because it's not a profit center, right? It's not. Uh, it's more of a cost center, and uh, the CEO, if he says, "Okay, we need to hire a bunch of people and we need them really quick, and this is what we want to do," um, then uh, the HR, you know, doesn't have time to worry about. Um, okay, what is going to happen to the culture of the organization if we hire so many people so quickly, or uh, what is going to happen to the well-being of the current employees and so on. They don't have the luxury to worry about those things. So I think ultimately, unfortunately, I think to some extent, you need in many organizations a separate department. Okay, So Starbucks has a chief happiness officer, right, uh, who's really interested or worried about or concerned about, I should say, uh, this, this idea of well-being. LinkedIn is a similar company, um, which has this. And Google has a people analytics department. So... Uh, long story short, I would say that uh, HR ought to be the house for this, but I think because of baggage from the past, uh, new departments are now coming up uh, that seem to be tackling this topic of happiness of employees. Very interesting. Thank you, Professor, for that. So uh, again, a bunch of questions coming in. Um, I think this is more of a personal uh, question here from Vijay and the other. Um, he asks, uh, how do we change how we perceive others or the world around us? Because at the end of the day, that's beyond our control. No, I don't think it's beyond your control. Um, when I talk about abundance culture uh, in my course, you'll see if you take it, that I really talk about, again, consistent with the two to Bamba uh, idea. Now, there is a bunch of things that the organization can do, right, that you perhaps cannot control, um, which has to do with the cultural elements, which has to do with how they incentivize, how they treat uh, employees who have taken risks but have failed and so on, okay? But there's a bunch of things you can do yourself, okay? And the... Abundance orientation has the, from the organizational perspective, they bring in the cultural angle. But from your perspective, you can bring in an, what I call an abundance, an abundance mindset. Okay, what that involves is looking at the world in a way that uh, you feel happy with and content with where you are, what you have, rather than uh, looking at the world from the perspective of, okay, for me to win, somebody else has to lose. And how can I grab? And how can I, uh, you know, be... Uh, assured of my share of the pie uh, and so on. Okay, I'm not saying that that kind of a scarcity orientation is uh, not useful or not relevant in any context. I mean, if you're in a war, if, you're, if your life circumstance is circumscribed by scarcity, where there's very little to go around and um, your, your survival itself is at stake, 
then then of course you should be scarcity oriented. But um, in a in a kind of situation that most of us are in right now, where our mere survival is no longer at stake, we don't have lions and tigers attacking us or people wanting to murder us. Uh, it, it's much better to have an abundance orientation. People with an abundance orientation, which is characterized by this idea of uh, for me to win, others don't have to lose. In fact, we can all grow the share of the pie, right? Make the pie bigger. Uh, that kind of an attitude, cooperative attitude, helpful attitude. Uh, this book that I referred to some time back, Give and Take by Adam Grant, really touches on that topic, right? It's all about that topic, in fact. Uh, he concludes that givers, surprisingly for many people, right? Givers are more likely to succeed than our takers or matchers. Okay, so I would highly recommend that you read it. I've given you a very, very one-line short summary. It's more intricate than that in reality. Uh, you should read it. Okay, so what can you do to adopt an abundance mindset? I would say start with a couple of things. Okay, one is maintain what I call a gratitude journal. Okay, uh, we are all kind of mired by what um, some, some researchers call a negativity dominance. Okay, there's 10 things happening in our life and nine of them are good and one of them is bad. We pay, tend to pay attention to that bad thing. Okay, why? Because in our, in our evolutionary past, it was important to pay attention to that negative thing because it could kill us. Okay, it could be a scheming, um, scheming, you know, a neighbor uh, who might leak news about our whereabouts to an enemy. Okay, it could be, uh, like I said, a, a kind of a, a dangerous animal, right? If we didn't pay attention to that one really big negative thing, we could die. Uh, it was important to survive and we are the progeny of those who survived okay so we have this um kind of genetic vestige if you will of um, being scarcity oriented but right now it's not being productive it's not serving us well because we are no longer find ourselves in that kind of a atmosphere or, or environment and it's much better to be abundance oriented in the environment in which we find ourselves which is doing creative work in which our survival is no longer at stake and so uh, what you do is through maintaining a gratitude journal where you note three good things that happen to me every day. Uh, you're offsetting that negativity dominance with positivity. It's called positivity offset. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson talks about it in her book, uh, Positivity. Okay, so uh, three small good things. You know, today my train landed on time, right? So I'm able to take this call on time. Um, you know, today uh, kind of a Good Samaritan helped me out when I was trying to lug my luggage up the staircase. Uh, you know, little good things that happen every every day. Uh, if you do this on a consistent basis, I've been doing it for now six, seven years, uh, then you start to see that it makes this very gentle but beautiful shift in your in your in the lens through which you view the world. You start viewing the world in I'd say more rose tinted glasses, not necessarily delusional, but certainly not jaundiced glasses, you know, the yellow tinted glasses that most of us are born with more or less. So we need to change that. Another thing that I would recommend is to take what I call a, a news fast and just stop looking at the news. You know, the news is horrible, right? I mean, most of the time it's about fighting and negativity and so on. And by news fast, I mean, maybe for a lot of us, a WhatsApp fast, okay? <laughs> because a lot of the news um, that we get is through WhatsApp. Of course, WhatsApp has a lot of positive messages too, because they are from friends and family, but it also has news about infighting and, you know, this government and that government and what they did and what these people did. and uh, It's divisive. Okay. So those are the two, uh, two things I would recommend. And on top of that, if you can take a nature feast, right, go out into nature. Nature is so calming, uh, so beautiful, so replenishing. And unfortunately in India, we don't have so much opportunity to do this. If you're in a city, we don't have so many parks. We don't have, in the US, I mean, you can drive for 15, 20 minutes from where I live at least uh, and, and be in the wilderness, you know. We don't have that uh, as much here. We can't do camping as easily and so on. But to the extent that you can, you know, get nature into your life, maybe just by having a couple of plants in your, in your, in your office, in your home, uh, that's going to help you as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. So, um, just to add to that last point, Professor, you know, most major cities in Mumbai, uh, even in India, uh, there are places that you can go trekking, for example, something mm. that personally, uh, Bangalore, Mumbai. So, uh, to add to your point about taking a nature feast. Okay. All right. That's great. You're good to know that. Yeah. Right. A uh, couple of more questions, I think. Um, uh, Aruna Pavaskar, I think it's more of an observation than a question. So, mm -hmm between Bamba, AMP of Daniel Pink, which is autonomy mastery purpose and this model of David Rock. Um, and, uh, you know, it uh, sees that as a good point since there is a narrative around certain concepts which are important to our well-being. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I think I, 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 you kind of broke up a little bit, Subhu. Sorry. So she's talking about uh, the uh, Daniel Pink um, framework and the David Rock framework. And what were you saying after that? Uh, and there is an overlap between uh, you know, the Bamba framework and yeah, these other couple of frameworks as well. Right, right, right. It, there, there is overlap, right? There is overlap. I think I don't explicitly talk about purpose. I obviously talk about um, connection uh, or belonging. Uh, as I call it, and uh, uh, as does uh, Daniel Pink, and he talks about mastery. Uh, sorry, he talks about autonomy, uh, not so much about uh, belonging. Um, and I, I talk about autonomy, and I talk about mastery. Uh, when it comes to David Rock, um, I'm trying to, I'm kind of trying to remember what he has, but he has this scarf model, I think. You know, status, yeah. connection, autonomy, relationship. Uh, no, C is not connection. Something else. Um, fairness, I think. So uh, I, I, you know. In the end, there are a bunch of limited concepts, okay? Uh, I include fairness under um, basic needs. I think it's so basic, um, uh, you know, that it's not uh, necessarily as basic as eating food and having medical thing attention, but uh, it's, it's pretty much the next layer up, you know, um, if you think of a hierarchy of uh, needs model. So um, I, I do cover all of these and uh, it, the, the, my approach, my framework is based off of uh, a set of theories. Um, together, they're called self-determination theory. And uh, that's where I'm coming from. And also based off of my interactions with organizations and interviews with people and all that. Sure. Great. Okay. Um, I think this is uh, in relation to your previous question, Professor, which is uh, you know, the HR piece that you spoke of. Uh -huh. One is asking if there is if this is something which is happiness. Is this something that the employee engagement department uh, can look into? Is this sort of an extension for them? Is that one way of uh, looking at it? Mm -hmm. So uh, employee engagement department, uh, you know. So I, I, in my dealings with organizations, I really haven't come across an organization that has something that is specifically, you know, a whole department devoted only to engagement. Okay, uh, and maybe the person asking the question can enlighten me on this, which organization it is. But uh, usually that's uh, a kind of a, one of the many goals that the HR department is ta tasked with is to increase the engagement of the employees in the organization. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the one kind of grouse I have a little bit against things like engagement and morale and productivity is that it's it's very much a kind of organizational focused thing, right? Uh, it's very clear from the organization's perspective that having an engaged task force is super important, okay? It's not so clear from the employee's perspective why they should offer this engagement to the organization, okay? To me, it seems that if the organization were, were true, uh, were, um, um, authentically interested in the employees. And that would only really happen if they truly, the leadership truly believed that the, uh, the employees in the organization are part of a large family, right? At some level. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't be interested. Uh, they would just use the employee as a, as a resource, right? The HR, uh, you know, resource, it's kind of, it's not a good term, you know, employees are not another asset of your firm that you try and milk and maximize profits out of. Employees are living things that, um, uh, you know, emotional beings that for whom happiness matters a lot. And so, uh, and here's the irony, right? I mean, if you actually become authentically interested in the employee's happiness levels, uh, there's a much greater chance that you actually get them to be engaged. Um, but if you talk directly in terms of engagement and wanting to increase engagement, uh, then perhaps, uh, you know, it's not going to be as successful, I think. So you got to get it, get to it at a deeper level, and that's what I think a really a bunch of really good firms do, right? They they understand that um, you know it's not even a cognitive thing; it's it's much more of a heart oriented thing that they they do unto their employees, the leaders do unto their employees what they would have done unto them, uh, which is to treat them fairly, treat them with respect, treat them with love, dignity, treat them as if they're part of a big family. Um, and when that happens, then naturally all these other downstream consequences, of course, at the very right end of that downstream consequences profits, but uh, before that productivity, before that engagement and morale, and before that satisfaction, and before that, if you can kind of tackle the well-being piece, the happiness piece, and, and oftentimes it's tough, you know, because there's limited resources and there's competing agendas and, you know, sometimes companies grow too fast. 
uh, for you to be able to maintain that family atmosphere and we you miss that growth phase then you risk not you know not being as competitive later so i'm not saying it's easy but uh, i would say that if you can kind of focus on the happiness and well-being piece and really make it integral to your company's culture and objectives then all the other pieces are more likely to follow great wonderful i i like how you put that on a spectrum uh, in going backwards from profits productivity mm-hmm. morale and then happiness so you know that full spectrum of i think that's great uh, thanks for that um so uh, i think just a couple of more questions here almost i think we are we're anyway out of time but just a couple of more questions professor since they sure. okay shall we get through them quickly yeah okay so uh, venkat uh, from hyderabad is asking that you know as a child everybody is happy uh, you know and once you start to grow up go to school uh, you know we experience uh, you know life in certain ways so uh, when does start one uh, when does one start perceiving the importance of being happy right and he gives the example of jrd tata who came up with a happiness quotient and mm-hmm. that hr can take and measure like engagement uh, organization yeah so again you cut out a little bit but what i got from what you said is that as children we um, are happy innately and then we lose our touch with happiness and uh, and then from there on you went to this idea of uh, measuring happiness in organization so can you bridge those two concepts Yeah, so I think there are two parts to the questions, Professor. So one is the entire, you know, we probably lose out on happiness as we grow. I think that's what he's referring to. Mm-hmm. And the second part is the organization context, and he gives the example of JRD Tata. Mm-hmm. At one point, came up with a happiness quotient, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, is that is that a parameter that HR can measure within an organization? Yeah. So I'm not familiar with the JRD Tata's happiness quotient. I'll Google it right after this call uh, to become aware of it. uh thank you for that reference uh i you know in whatever way that it's measured though i think the idea is super important right and i think this is what i mean i think um people who have been leaders for a while who are particularly kind of uh, enlightened leaders uh, will recognize the importance of the topic so i'm not surprised that somebody like jrd tata uh, recognize the importance of it now he may or may not have based his happiness quotient, quotient on on scientific work uh, emerging work but now we have the advantage of that too you know valid scales reliable scales happiness is um, as you might imagine uh, a little bit complex to measure okay so uh, we so the, the fact that this scientific work on it is actually useful now back to the first part of it uh, yeah as children and now you know i i wish that as venkat you know noted i wish actually that most children were happy most of the time and i do think that uh, it doesn't take a lot for children to be happy you know if they uh, have a, a loving atmosphere that is the single most important thing um you mentioned neediness and avoidance for my course if you remember i talked about the importance of uh, contact comfort being hugged as children particularly soon after they born up to one and a half years old now that's the single biggest determinant of whether they end up later on becoming needy or avoidant or not you know if they're given a lot of love they become secure if they're not then there's a good chance that they're going to be needy and currently in india even currently i would say that you know family is so important uh, unlike in many western countries in the us uh, you know for a variety of reasons both parents end up working and uh, the children are left to sleep by themselves that's a horrible thing to happen to kids okay i hope that uh, listeners if you have kids of your own you know uh, you, you don't do that okay the, the, you're really screwing up the children's psychological balance uh, particularly when it comes to relationships later on if you do that um so apart from that though you know even if you give them a lot of that love and belonging um the competitive juices in which we we kind of marinate uh nowadays uh is going to lead us to doing other things that i call happiness sins right like chasing superiority over other people being overly control seeking being completely mind oriented as opposed to heart oriented uh, not being in touch with our emotions and so on so lots of other challenges even if you get a lot of love and it's those challenges those Uh, absorption of those sins quote unquote sins right that lead to the, the degradation of happiness uh, of happy children and then the path is to kind of recognize that hey you know i started out being happy now i'm unhappy how what come how come and uh, how can i reverse this and then then begins the journey right uh, so uh, i think the milestone there is to recognize that you know this is not the life i want to have this is not as good as I, I thought people told me people give me a lie. You know, you you achieve these things, you're going to be happy forever. In fact, I'm less happy than I was. So, so then you start this journey of uh, kind of, in a sense, reversing, but actually transcending uh, some of the qualities uh, that as human beings uh, we are endowed with. 
uh, which make us unhappy. Anyway, that's a long, big topic. I, I would recommend my course and my book for it. Right. Thank you. And a clarification also from uh, Mr. Venkat Ramana. He says he's referring to the fact that when JRD Data was asked, you know, does he want it to be a wealthy country? He answered that I want to see India as a happy country. Ah, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so I think one last question, which is uh, again at a personal level, I think Kapilesh is asking. Um, which is that can we consistently remain happy and won't happy people become unhappy with uh, happiness, right? So right. he's talking about the hedonic treadmill mm -hmm. and basically that's what he's mentioned. Right. It's a great question. And I think most people's intuitions are that, that uh, you can't be consistently happy. Uh, I have a nuanced response to that. Okay. And one part of the response is, okay, can you be consistently unhappy? And do you know anybody who's depressed almost all the time? And most people say, yeah, you know, there is actually somebody like that. If that, if that can be true, then why can't you be happy all the time, right? Why can't you be consistently happy all the time? Um, more, I think, technically, uh, it really depends on how you define happiness, okay? If you define it as pleasure, surely you can't make it last for very long at all, okay? Not even for a whole, whole day, uh, maybe not even for an hour, right? But if you define happiness along the lines of how I defined it earlier, which is um, not wanting to be somewhere else doing something else, Okay, um, so if you're doing something that's unpleasant, maybe you're pulling an all nighter, but you're doing it for a worthy cause because you aligned with the work's purpose um, and you're making this huge presentation that's going to have a big impact on the company and help a lot of people out. Uh, so all of these things have to fit in. Okay, so if you feel that you're not able to sustain your happiness, then probably you're not doing the right set of things in your life. Okay. Uh, if you feel in particular that, you know, less than 50% of the time, am I really happy? Then you need to re-examine what you're doing in your life. Okay. Then of course, it doesn't mean that that's going to be easy from there on, because it might mean that you need to kind of change, right? And change jobs, change cities, change relationships sometimes. Um, and those are very troubling questions. And some of us prefer to kind of, you know, sweep them under the carpet um, because the existential anxiety that comes out of uh, you know, <laughs> uh, unraveling those issues uh, can be more than one can bear. But uh, the, the, technically, you can be happy almost all the time. Okay, that's my short answer. Great, wonderful. I think that's a that's a great way to uh, close. So you can be happy all the time. I think that's uh, that's the message that we would like to take away from this uh, topic. And uh, I know we've we've <laughs> short uh, overshot our time by fifteen minutes, but that's okay. I think it's good that we had this conversation with all of you asking questions uh, to Professor. Thanks a lot. Um, once again, Professor, for uh, taking the time out. I have four pages filled with notes uh, through this webinar. Mm -hmm. So thank you um, for taking the time out and to also speak to our audience, uh, sharing your insights in terms of how you view the topic and what it means specifically in the organization's context. I think we had some uh, very good uh, nuanced discussions around those. Um, so thank you uh, once again, uh, Professor, and thanks everybody on this uh, call who have taken the time out on a pretty busy uh, morning, I'm sure. Uh, we hope that this was useful for you and you uh, get an opportunity to go back and apply some of these uh, concepts that we spoke about today. And of course, if you have anything, you can always reach out to me or Professor. You have our email addresses. Um, and thanks a lot once again, Professor, for taking the time. Alrighty. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.